um, since the topic was so broad, um, I thought well, I could say anything which would fit this broad topic. So yesterday we had a pretty broad discussion on uh, global economic uh, governance uh, reforms. Um, so I thought since this was about the role of the international community, but what the international community can do, I thought maybe we should talk a little bit more about the action rather than about broad frameworks. Uh, so <clears throat> in doing so, I want to focus on um, how we can better address uh, together um, shocks that particularly affect agricultural livelihoods. And uh, of course, I'll want to talk about that particular aspect since um, uh, I'm receiving an income from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, but before getting to <clears throat> the precise shocks and what we can do about it, um, important to put it in the broader perspective of what challenges we're facing uh, for securing food security for future generations and also for the current generations, um, uh, also particularly in the context of environmental constraints. <clears throat> uh, I guess the, the first main challenge is to be able to sustainably meet growing food demand. We have <clears throat> still a bit of a ex population explosion in front of us with two billion more people being added to the world population over the next um, 35 years. Um, most of them will be living in cities, um, which also creates, uh, uh, together with income growth, creates uh, large changes in food demands, uh, particularly towards um, away from uh, staple crops towards more fruits, vegetables, and particularly meats, which are more resource uh, intensive. Now we estimate, uh, our latest estimates, that, that, that food demand will increase uh, from present levels by about 50% over the next 35 years. That seems like a very um, achievable target, so to speak, uh, if we look at the past history, since if I'll take the previous 40 years, the world more or less tripled food production, so another 50% should not be a major uh, challenge. But it is because in the past, a lot of the, um, <clears throat> the food expansion or the expansion of food production came from expanding land and extensive use of natural resources where in most regions, those, uh, the limits of expanding them have been reached uh, or would be too costly to put into agricultural production. So the challenge is how to do that, how to be able to feed the overall world population um, through more sustainable means of production, more intensive use of the existing natural resources. Now out of that, and with increasing urbanization, what we should expect to see is a lot more competition for natural resources, land, water, uh, forest, and so on. Out of that, we should expect to see possible conflicts emerging uh, moving forward if we don't manage them properly. Uh, likewise, access to food will remain challenging, uh, even though we see, uh, have seen a lot of uh, reduction in uh, our measure of, uh, of malnutrition or of undernourishment because of improvement in access. <clears throat> but still, a lot of the, um, the, the poor and food insecure uh, live in remote rural areas uh, with um, also difficult uh, difficulties in improving their uh, income situation in order to access food. So unless we address the, f the structural problems uh, around access to food, it will be difficult to achieve the global targets uh, of uh, ending hunger by 2013. Um, we're facing already in many countries uh, a triple burden of malnutrition, still under nourishment, Two billion people around the world with a lack of micronutrients. More than two billion people overweight, obese, with uh, enormous uh, risk of ex additional risk, uh, health risks around the world. And all of that's associated with uh, dietary changes, changes in food patterns, which I mentioned before, which is also increasing uh, pressures on natural resources. We have to face up with climate change, um, 
which may uh, affect the sustainable increases um, um, and as well as what, what I will talk about a little bit more is transboundary pests and diseases, uh, some of which uh, aren't being enhanced by the effects of uh, climate change. Um, so there's all kinds of risks uh, there. And on top of that, uh, there's enormous uh, social aspects that emanate from, from agriculture um, where we need to increase productivity, particularly in the areas where most of the population growth uh, will take place in, in Africa and uh, South Asia, uh, out of which uh, employment challenges emerge, particularly with uh, enormous huge bulge in those countries that are still growing, particularly in Africa. Um, with very little opportunities for employment in, um, in non-agricultural sectors. So the question is, to what extent can agriculture, uh, in part, help absorb uh, that growing labor force in order to avoid uh, what we see, a lot more migration that uh, <coughs> emerges out of the distress and will put pressure on other parts of the system. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on any of these, these challenges, but I want to dwell a little bit on is a bit more how we can address the, the challenges coming from protected crisis, uh, natural disasters, and, and conflict situations that could set back the progress you can make on all these other fronts in trying to improve food security uh, and fish, um, move, moving forward, uh, particularly because, well, one thing we see is that uh, countries that are in protected crisis tend to have three times higher levels of, uh, of prevalence of food <coughs> insecurity and, and malnutrition, uh, but also are more likely to um, uh, have enormous setbacks in their development uh, and putting additional pressure on the uh, tensions that I mentioned before. <coughs> so. Let me dwell a bit on those issues to see what action can be undertaken to um, mitigate the effects, the risks, um, and uh, out of that also uh, get more structural progress moving forward. Um, as FEO, uh, among the shocks that we're trying to address and that affect uh, agricultural livelihoods, uh, there's a whole range of shocks. Uh, and particularly when they come together, we call them a protected crisis because then typically uh, they, uh, the, the impacts uh, last much longer. So let me <coughs> address some of these challenges. Um, we take natural resource um, hazards, uh, natural hazards, uh, climate-related disasters. Um, we see an increased frequency, intensity, and impact, particularly uh, weather-related disasters, and most of these uh, primarily affect agricultural sectors and agricultural uh, livelihoods. Um, over the, uh, the past decades, we see that 80% of these disasters relate to climate, um, that agriculture sectors bear uh, a large share of the, the cost, uh, up to 25%. Uh, a lot of the other costs tend to go into infrastructure. In the case of droughts, when infrastructure is not as much affected, then 80% uh, is carried by agriculture sectors uh, alone. This has also a major source of the place, displacement of people um, uh, on average over the past uh, years. We've seen uh, more than 20 million people being displaced just because of uh, natural disasters. Already mentioned, protected crisis and, and conflicts. Uh, also there we see them intensifying and most of the conflicts are being fought in rural areas. Thereby also directly affecting uh, agricultural uh, livelihoods. Important there is that um, if we don't address them properly, you see protected crises uh, relapse. Uh, even if the countries grow out of it, they relapse within 10 years uh, unless um, uh, destructive causes are being addressed. Um, last year, because of crisis and conflict, uh, we had 65 million people, uh, broad estimate, uh, displaced because of that. And a lot of these people are being displaced for long periods uh, of time. So these shocks, uh, again, uh, affect uh, food security um, and uh, agricultural uh, livelihoods. Um, lastly, we see also an increasing uh, 
<coughs> tendency of more outbreaks of transboundary animal and plant disease, plants, pests, and diseases. Um, some of them compounded by effects of uh, climate change or warmer, warmer temperatures, uh, but also of lacks of controls uh, among um, in on farms and uh, in food chains. And that's affecting uh, a lot of agricultural livelihoods and for individual farmers, uh, those can be devastating uh, if you get a, a locust plague or uh, wheat rust, uh, it can uh, devastate your entire harvest and sometimes for uh, more than one season. Um, so what are we trying to do as SFVO with partners? And I think that uh, we're in the idea of um, resilience building. We see a lot of uh, uh, partnerships emerging both across UN agencies, um, and our partners uh, linked to the World Food Program, um, but also um, uh, other parts of the UN system, but more importantly also uh, <coughs> engagement with um, on the ground NGOs that try to, to build a resilience um, uh, as well as the private sector uh, when it comes to, to combating uh, plant diseases and transboundary animal uh, diseases. Um, so we, we have a focus on four areas of action. Uh, one is to prepare governments and national stakeholders better to be prepared to address risk. Uh, we see still too much that, can, uh, that governments and other actors come into action once the crisis is already there. So what it means is um, trying to uh, have built-in disaster risk uh, reduction strategies um, into uh, national uh, agriculture policies and rural development uh, policies. Um, likewise, to have um, uh, Prepare, prep, uh, being prepared to address uh, the post, uh, possible outbreak of uh, animal diseases and so on to have an immediate uh, response capacity. But most importantly um, is to build the connection between emergency relief action and development action. And uh, that's a particular challenge that we see. I'll come back to that point uh, to the end. Um, the second area um, of intervention that um, uh, can be extremely effective if you have uh, the resources, uh, you put the capacity in place is uh, what we call watch to safeguard, which is early warning systems that are not just alarming, but also are directly connected how to get into action once you see um, a problem uh, emerging. So we have um, early warning systems uh, that relate to the outbreaks of animal diseases, uh, the possible outbreak of plant diseases. Um, we have an integrated phase classification system that uh, is built up from multiple assessments of multiple stakeholders, how uh, possible outbreaks of uh, food uh, insecurity situations, famines, um, could, could be early identified in order to come to early action. Uh, likewise, on food prices, uh, we have a system, and on resilience um, measurement, which tries to identify what are the factors that determine the degree of resilience of individual households to be able to respond to a shock in order to identify if that those indicators of resilience fall, that something needs to be done in order to uh, prevent an, uh, the next shock to become catastrophic for uh, large groups of, uh, of households. Um, then ap applying uh, the third area of risk and vulnerability uh, measures that can range from agricultural interventions when it comes to greater resistance to natural shocks, uh, natural um, disaster sh shocks, um, for instance, like uh, putting in agroforestry uh, techniques into place, which uh, provides more protection against uh, uh, windbreaks, uh, or can act as windbreaks that can avoid soil erosion um, and can uh, retain more water in the ground uh, if applied uh, properly. Those, a lot of those practices also link to what we call climate smart agriculture, that if put in place, they can help protect uh, against the shocks of uh, natural disasters, as well as uh, prepare for and adapt to the consequences of, uh, of climate change. Um, and then uh, 
put into the capacity of what we call prepare and respond to crisis um, is to have uh, actions in place that could immediately respond to crisis, um, where it comes, it could be food reserves, seed reserves, um, uh, fishery, emergency protection if, uh, if the emergencies are in fisheries uh, and likewise for uh, livestock. So these are sets of interventions that we put in practice uh, with governments, uh, with stakeholders on the ground and with international partners in order to try and be better prepared for natural disasters can affect uh, rural livelihoods. These are consistent with international policy responses. Um, uh, there's the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, if we make true on that, uh, also has uh, clear indications how to uh, address uh, extreme weather events and uh, align the climate action uh, as related to agriculture, also with better preparedness for those um, uh, Christ potential crises. Um, and then the, our committee for uh, world food security um, has an action plan for uh, addressing uh, protected crisis and safeguards uh, food security and nutrition uh, during um, and after uh, uh, crisis. Um, and we have a One Health program, which is One Health for animal health and human health, particularly uh, to uh, have a response character that uh, animal health diseases diseases don't affect uh, also uh, human uh, health. Um, so we have the frameworks in place, we have the partnerships in place, yet um, we should fear a lot more uh, outbreaks of, of crisis simply because the capacity is still limited. We've seen that with the Ebola crisis. Uh, WHO uh, had uh, disinvested um, in uh, their emergency responses uh, and also, uh, as FEO, we had to gear up, back up, to uh, be able to respond quickly. So there's still capacity uh, constraints there. Part of that has to do with how development aid uh, comes. It's, uh, a lot of uh, humanitarian aid um, is being provided and has increased. Um, but when it comes to specific attention, which is relevant in this context, but it could be other sectors, attention for agriculture has decreased, which limits the capacity to uh, align humanitarian assistance with development uh, assistance. So, principle should be all become one pot of money, but the way humanitarian aid comes is very specific for specific types of actions and not easy to uh, divert uh, into uh, longer term development uh, efforts. Um, there will be other, other challenges, but uh, one thing that we're looking at uh, at the moment, and, and I'll uh, conclude uh, with that, is particularly uh, development dilemmas that may emerge in, uh, in crisis, in conflict uh, situations. Um, a lot of the action we try to aim at is to protect livelihoods, um, uh, improve animal health, where uh, people live of, uh, of livestock, um, which can be a good way to build resilience in conflict situations. But the dilemma sometimes is there. It can also be become, uh, an, uh, become a source of igniting further the conflict. As we see that in South Sudan, where um, uh, livestock is the main agriculture assets that most rural households have. So by making the livestock more healthy, we've also seen that becomes a prey for uh, the rebels uh, in order to uh, plunder the assets of, uh, of uh, vulnerable rural households. So, and there's similar examples we can give in Syria, we also try to provide aid. So we, we have to look at those dilemma very carefully that we protect rural livelihoods and out of that, and that's what's so, why it's so important to line these immediate called emergency responses with broader development efforts such that also the root causes of the conflict uh, will disappear. So let me stop here on um, hopefully a bit of a positive note how things can come together in order to um, uh, build more resilience and stave off crisis, um, but at the same time uh, emphasize that we have not solved those problems yet and a lot more needs to be done. Thank you.